entrepreneurs. So I can tell you that I bought, I was first made aware of Paper for Water when um, I think, I'm guessing you were not 10 yet. Um, so Paper for Water was at the Ransdagen Institute for a Conscious Capitalism meeting and there were these two lovely girls and they were telling the story about really their goal. Um, they learned how to fold origami and they were selling ornaments to fund water wells being drilled across the world because the problem is in these countries, you know, they have to go get water and it's usually the girls that go get water which means that they don't get to go to school. So I was so entranced by them. So of course I bought my first horn. I was just sharing. Uh, it's green. It has a purple bead on it. It's really beautiful. Although I have to say, all of you, this one's mine. They will make you another one, but that one's mine. I'm just going to claim it right now. Um, and so I've been following their story for the longest time. And here they are. They're not even out of high school yet. It's run by three of the most lovely, young, forward-thinking women you'll ever have the pleasure of meeting. They've raised $2 million, they've drilled 200 water wells across the world, they took an eight-month odyssey going to visit the places where they've made all these changes, which has just been so fascinating, we had a great conversation about it. Um, and then, you know, the fangirl part of me, again, um, if you happen to catch the Disney, you know, holiday specials where they take these wonderful families on these Disney vacations, they were on the show last year. So literally, again, fangirl. My husband, I think, dropped his mug. I let out this huge scream when I'm like, ah, Paper Wire's on the Disney thing. You know, I was so excited to see all of their hard work be really um, acknowledged because it's such an amazing vision and it's such an amazing vision from a great leader. So with that, I would love to introduce you to um, a great social preneur organization, Paper for Water, and I'll let Carl take it away. Well, the key to this presentation is to do little, very little talking on my part and listen to what they had to share with us. So that's that's the way this is going to work. Catherine Adams is co-CEO of Paper for Water, and her sister Isabel I should is the other co-CEO. Ken is kind of the minion, you know. He's he's the go he's the gopher, chauffeur, um, and these. Bright young ladies have been co-CEOs now for how many years? Seven years. So they were a little bit shorter when they got started. Um, but it's just an incredible story. And one of the things you may be thinking is, as we go along, how can I learn from what they've been through? So we're going to make sure we talk about some things that, that can apply to all of us. Let's get started by kind of expanding on what Kelly just introduced and kind of tell us how this all came about. Okay, so when I was five and my older sister was eight, we learned that a child died every 15 seconds from unclean water. And that girls didn't get to go to school because they were hauling water all day. And the boys did get to go to school. And we thought that that was really unfair and we wanted to do something about all those children who were dying. So we took something that we loved doing, which was origami, and we started taking donations for them. And our original plan was to raise about $500. But the first night of taking donations, we raised over $800. And that was on November 3rd, 2011. And by the end of the year, we had raised over $10,000. And we had overfunded a whole well in Ethiopia. And so we were like, well, we might as well keep going. And that was seven years ago. And up to date, we've raised over $1.6 million wow. and helped to fund over 170 water projects in 20 different countries. So with any venture, your brand is important, your product is important. How, where did origami come from? So my dad is half Japanese. He was born in Japan, and he grew up folding origami, and he taught me how to do it when I was four. And it was just a craft to do with dad, and it was just something really fun and social that I could do with my friends and family. And it's just, yeah. <laughs> so. Why do you think the origami has had the impact that it had 
um, in terms of what you're trying to deliver to the market and, and why? So origami is kind of cool because in one of these, it's about 30 sheets of paper and by yourself takes an hour. But if you do it with a group, it's around 10 minutes. And it's any, anybody can do it. And you don't have to be super gifted or talented to do it because it's just folding a sheet of paper. And with Paper for Water, all of, almost all our volunteers are kids. And a kid, like I was five when I learned how to do it. So anybody can do it. And that's just, it's just something really important to us that everybody's involved in doing it. So think about that, the power of that as far as the brand. It's not just that you can get an organ in the ornament, but you can actually participate volunteer your time, the money, you've already heard where the money goes and for what a great cause that is. So it's really a fascinating concept that I think that has clearly proven to be powerful. Um, now, you, you mentioned 10,000 in year one, approaching two million now in, in this many years. Um, that's, that's pretty rapid growth. What are some of the key challenges that you faced along the way? So scheduling is kind of hard because I'm 13 and I'm still in school. Um, so just balancing paper for water, sports, schools, all of that. It's just, it's a challenge. Um, but we try to balance out everything and make it work. Um, oh, also when we, we've been in Neiman Marcus and season, no, four seasons, yeah. And just big scale stuff like that in the Galleria, just organizing all these volunteers and getting them together and getting volunteers. It's just, it's been an interesting journey and it's also been a challenge. Tell us just a little bit about how you find the, the wells that you want to help to find. What's the background there? So we work with a drilling company called Living Water International. And what they do is they go out in the community and they have boots on the ground and they find where the greatest need is. And when you put in a water project, it's not just like you go in, you do it, and then you come back out. They invest about two years, which each, yeah, which each community. And it's just an ongoing growing thing because before the community can even have a water project, they have to know like sanitation and hygiene because there's no point in putting a water project in there if their bucket's going to be dirty when they get the water. So it's just, it's a huge long process that they do. Talk a little bit about how you and your sisters actually, because you have a third one coming into the fold now. How do you, how do you share roles? How do you divide up responsibilities? And, and tell us a little bit about how the board supports you. So Isabel and I, we kind of do the same stuff. We usually do it together. Um, but she's a little bit more controlling, so she likes to be in charge. <laughs> um, she's the older one. So she usually tells us what to do, and of course she helps, but she's usually the one who's kind of telling us what to do. Um, Trinity is, she's, um, she has very short attention span, but she also helps us fold, um, and she is our marketing director now. So, and our board, they are so supportive. They've helped us so many different times, so many different ways, and they're just amazing. So, you, one of the things, fascinating things I hadn't occurred to me, but seemed obvious when you told me was um, that as you young ladies are growing up, that kind of changes a little bit about how your brand is looked at. Talk about the pluses and minuses of that. So one of the minuses of getting older is when I was a five-year-old, I could go up to literally anybody and ask them to buy an ornament or do anything and they sure. Um, so it's kind of this cute factor that I realize I'm kind of losing here. Um, but when I used to walk into the room, it'd be all these adults and they'd be like, oh my gosh, they're so cute. But now it's like, oh, you're a teenager. Oh, okay. Um, one of the pluses though is as you're getting older, of course, I've gotten more responsibilities in this business. And um, 
Actually, there aren't that many pluses, though. <laughs> but, <laughs> now that I realize that. Um, but we still have we still have our youngest, and she's pretty cute. So we got that for a couple more years. <laughs> Actually, one of the stories that I love to tell, in 2013, we went to India uh, to visit some of our water projects. And before we left the States, about three months before we left, I tried to get an appointment with the US ambassador to India. I thought it'd be really neat for the girls to meet her. And I emailed her, I wrote her letters, I called her office, and there was literally no response. So about a month and a half before we left, I finally said, Isabel, can you send her an email from your email account and start out the email with, I'm nine years old. And literally within 24 hours, she responded and she said, I'm in town the whole week and just tell me what hour you'd like to block out and we'll meet with you. And she met with us for three hours. It was so amazing. And after that meeting, I said, look at that, Isabel. Look, I'm, I've been the chief medical officer of a publicly traded company. I'm a pretty successful adult. I'm a physician. I couldn't get her to respond, and you got her to respond in less than 24 hours. You have power as a child, and you need to capitalize on this. Think about it. How do you apply that to your business? <laughs> <laughs> so one of our themes in this symposium is the change, the change that's going on in the economy, and there's a lot of different ways that that's happening. Think about how that's been impacting you over the recent years, and what have you done to, to respond to that? So social media is changing um, from Facebook to Instagram. Um, it's just, it's all changing, and what was it, a Yahoo article we got... 3,000 like followers in from one article but now it's it's much harder to get people to follow and stuff like that um, so we moved from Facebook to Instagram and now to YouTube so it's just like the changes in social media I think too uh, we, we have said that while there are fluctuations in our donors and people who order ornaments when there's a downturn in the economy but there really shouldn't be a change in doing good in the world uh, during a down, downturn. And so we're really focused on kind of maintaining our presence, uh, both locally and uh, in, the, in the community as a whole. Um, but um, as far as what we have seen kind of economically over the last seven years, every year we've continued to grow. Um, and that we have changed our focus a little bit from really trying to get more donors, which we would love, uh, to getting more and more volunteers. And we have found that as we grow our brand, uh, people have organically come to us. So um, Four Seasons, as a for instance, uh, this last year they approached us and we did a, uh, their two Christmas trees in their lobby. And that was something that they had just seen uh, us more and more in, in the media. Um, I think they'd seen the Galleria installation also uh, and thought that would be really neat uh, to do. So changing our focus a little bit from trying to make money to actually spreading our brand and getting more and more influencers uh, has, has continued to help us grow. Certainly as a nonprofit, the, the volunteer dimension is critical and maybe a slightly different from a company that's not not for profit, but talk a little bit more about how do you expand that and still keep the, the control, the qualities, the effort that needs to go into it to work for you. So I just heard the word control and I started laughing because my mom is, she's in charge of most of that and she she keeps it pretty controlled. Um, she has a group that meets once a week at our house. Um, we also have folding parties that meets once a month and we have never really had a control problem um, because it's people who are coming to give their time because they want to help other people and they want to do good. Um, so we've never really had a problem of control per se, but just like making sure everybody is doing something and having something for them to do and the organization behind it is a little bit more difficult, but... We've also changed how we do things a little bit because early on when it was just us as a family, uh, quality control was not an issue. It, it, what, what didn't get used kind of got thrown away or recycled. Um, but as we grew, it became harder and harder. I mean, we have thousands of pieces of origami that are folded on a weekly basis, and it's kind of hard to keep quality control uh, going. We have pieces that arrive from around the world, literally. Um, and 
we have had to become a lot more particular about who we actually get to fold ornaments that we sell under our brand. So we have branched out a little bit and we have suggested to youth groups and uh, Girl Scout troops, etc. Why don't you actually host the market yourself and sell the ornaments that you're creating? Uh, and that has worked really well because, of course, parents are going to buy their kids ornaments regardless of how crappy they are. Uh, <laughs> parents are like that. Uh, we love parents. And, um, and so then we don't have to, to take on that kind of risk and liability of, of uh, having people ship us stuff that we end up not using. What about the creative aspect? Are there any challenges with what do, what do we keep adding to our portfolio of product that gets the interest of the public? So we have a lot of really creative volunteers who are always like, oh, here's this new fold and this new fold. Um, we have had a couple problems with like, like people who have like owned the fold and we've tried to use it. Um, but usually it's just, these are like, the pretty basic, simple ones that are easy for our volunteers to fold. Um, but for like more like money, you can get like much more advanced ones. And it's just, yeah. It's, it's interesting that yes, people do actually own the intellectual property around the ornaments that they create uh, and how you use it and how you advertise for it. Um, this, this star right here, I won't refer to it as a star. It's the Bassetta star. TM, uh, <laughs> and he's very he's very adamant uh, that whenever it's used that he gets credit for it. Um, but but it is actually something that we have sold in the Neiman Marcus catalog. So he was willing to part a little bit with uh, like getting um, a percent of the revenue. But some of some of other artists are not, uh, and so we have to be careful with, with what we use and what we do. Uh, I'm going to brag on Catherine a little bit. Um, because over the last seven years she has created her own ornament and that was really neat we couldn't find it anywhere in the literature we talked to a number of origami artists and they said yeah that is actually a new ornament uh, and then I'll talk about one of our volunteers her name is uh, Ekaterina Lukasheva and she's got a, an amazing website and she herself is an astrophysicist literally PhD astrophysicist uh, and born and raised in Russia uh, and she creates about 52 of those a year. Like she does about one new creation a week. She dreams this stuff. She sees this stuff in her head. And when you talk to her, you're like, oh my gosh, that's just amazing. Uh, to, so to put it in perspective, that Catherine has created one, she creates, I don't know, 50, 60 a year. It, it's hard to create new ornaments. It really, it really is. So we have to rely on uh, other people. Oh, oh, oh. Was he standing? Was he standing? He locked his knees. He locked his knees. Yeah, if you not lock your knees, you're standing for too long, you'll pass a car. We had to do some training. We had to walk around the circles. All the kids were asking to get some tools. So my favorite ornament is similar to this one right there, but it's opened and it has like frills on each sheet of paper. It takes a lot longer, but it's really pretty. Hmm? Yes. <laughs> yes, for sure. How much do they all cost? Um, so they range anywhere from twenty to sixty dollars on this tree, and then we have some that are up to like two hundred dollars. So it just depends. <coughs> 
Yes, paperforwater.org is our website. Yes. Come if you there. saw someone else's handbook, then I There's a question right there. Um, so, as like, you know, an organization that's nonprofit, you, you run it yourself. How do you um, organize kind of the people that, that work with you because they're volunteers, obviously they're not working for you? So, how do you manage that dynamic? So, we have a lot of people who actually need volunteer hours. So, we actually don't have to worry about people coming because they actually need to volunteer hours for school. But we have a lot of school groups that we meet like weekly or monthly. And so having people come is not so much of a problem as just like when they come, organizing them and getting them different projects to work on. Could you tell us more about the school groups? I realize that there's a, a group of students at Ursuline Academy here in Dallas formed the Paper for Water Club at Ursuline. Yes. So could you tell us a bit more about like, I guess the, the more the benefit and kind of the structure of like what a, what a Paper for Water Club at a school would do to benefit you guys? So we have quite a few clubs across the United States. And what they do is they fold, um, some of them they do their own gift fairs, like he was talking about, um, at their school. Um, we, they just help us at events. They usually come, they volunteer for us if we had like a big event or anything. So they're super helpful and pretty awesome. One more question here. Oh, yes. How do you socialize with your clients? Sure, I can talk to that. Uh, Catherine doesn't have a smartphone or a Facebook account. So. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Yeah, we also don't have a TV in our house. That's why uh, we have all that's that's time. Time to do this. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly it. The, the longer story there is my wife and I live literally next door to where we currently live in an upstairs duplex. And we moved next door and we thought that because we were moving next door that it was going to be really easy to do and we did not plan ahead. It took us three months to move. <laughs> <laughs> It was ridiculous, but I, uh, I actually turned off the cable next door, and then because it took so long for us to move, I didn't reconnect, or I didn't notice that we hadn't had it for three months, and I was like, oh my gosh, we just saved $300. Let's see how long we can take this. Well, 16 years later, we don't have a TV in the house. It was, it was a fluke, and it just turned out wonderful. And because of that, we're like, you can make this... <laughs> Not, not always to dream it, yeah. Um, but because of giving up that TV, we're like, well, there are other things, uh, technology-wise, that we can we can give up. We have we have computers in the house. Uh, there, uh, my wife and I have smartphones. Um, but uh, Isabel does not have a smartphone. Catherine Trinity, not, none of them have smartphones. And probably never will. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, and, and what I told Isabel was at the point that she could afford her own and pay the bill, she was more than welcome to have her own, and she looked at the cost of that and said, it's not worth it. Yeah. So, uh, to answer your question, sorry, about social media, we, you know, social media has been kind of a plus minus uh, for us in the grand scheme of things as far as uh, new donors, new product, uh, or new places to sell. I, I truly believe that social media gives us a lot of credibility from the standpoint of view that you can track our history over the last 10 years. You can get on, you can see pictures from when the kids had their first Starbucks when they were five and eight, their first Starbucks show. So there's a certain amount of credibility that it brings. And we interact, we have a highly engaged uh, base of followers on all our social media. They're great and they comment on everything and they share it with their friends and family. Um, but I don't ultimately know how much product we sell solely because of social media. Um, we, we, do, we do, so don't get me wrong, and, and we put money into it. We, we have social media people that we actually pay uh, to, to, to represent our brand, and especially with our uh, increase in YouTube. Um, oh, and please, everybody subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, Paper for Water is the name of it, uh, F-O-R. Um, and uh, so we do put money towards that and we, what we are trying to do with our social media platform with YouTube is actually get more kids involved. We are filming a lot of our, our installation projects, our larger installation projects, really to demonstrate that what we do is not rocket science and it's not complicated, but it's consistency, it's perseverance. That's really what's, what's made us uh, who we are today, is continuing to, to show up and, and do, do the work that we say that we're gonna do. So, 
minutes here. Um, so as you think about the, again, our kind of our theme of the, of the changes we all have to adapt to as businesses grow and change and the, and the economic climate changes, you've probably learned a few lessons. I'd like, to, what could you share with our audience that might help them to think about what they're facing going into the future? So Bill Gates once said, you underestimate, you, no, you overestimate what you can accomplish in one year, but grossly underestimate what you can accomplish in 10 years. So I've been doing this for the majority of my life, and it just taught me to persevere and to just show up and keep doing it because it produces such amazing results. You just can't give up, though. Pretty good lesson there, I think. 13-year-old. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, in simplistic terms, what I'm hearing about your vision is we want to fund more wells. We want to expand this. Give us just a little more insight as to what five or ten years from now might look like as you're thinking about it today. So, short term, we're trying to expand our volunteer and donor base, of course. Um, do more large-scale installations because it's a lot easier to do an installation than make like 10,000 ornaments. Um, but long term, I know we're going to solve the world water crisis in my lifetime. But that's just like the first building block because you have education and medical and you have hunger and so many different other problems that you can't help unless you have water at the bottom. So when you put it in monetary terms, the world water crisis is somewhere between a 40 and an $80 billion issue, which sounds like a ton. But then you learn that on an annual basis, the US consumers spend $400 billion on Christmas alone, Christmas <laughs> presents alone. So 10%, 20% of the Christmas budget would solve the world water crisis. That's a really incredible dimension, isn't it? If we all gave up 10% of our Christmas spending and gave it to them, there would be no water problem. Fascinating. We have to think about how to accomplish that. Um, so, you, I know you guys still want to ask a lot of questions. I want to make sure we have time for that. So, please, what would you like to hear more about? Yes. Where do you see yourself in the next? five, seven, ten years? How has this impacted what your thoughts are for your, what you want to study, your career? What are some of your dreams and thoughts about your future? Um, it's opened my eyes to a bunch of different like options. Like I've seen retail and the business side of this, the nonprofit side, and I've just gotten so many different experiences that kids my age wouldn't normally receive. Um, getting to like partner with Neiman Marcus and see like all of that and just so many different opportunities. I see myself in the future. I definitely want to continue to help people. Um, I don't know when I grow up if I will be doing paper for water or something like that, um, but I will definitely want to continue to help people. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You said something in the early part of your presentation about challenges that you mm -hmm. Tell us more. So, so one of them was scheduling. I actually came here from school, a school concert, and it was a tight little, <laughs> it was a fast drive. Was the car. I was changing the car, <laughs> yes. So, along scheduling, just trying to balance everything out because often paper for water stuff, meetings, events are during school hours. And that's kind of hard to miss school so many times, but I go to an amazing school. And their one rule is if I skip school, I have to wear my school uniform. Um, so this is obviously not it, <laughs> but school hours are out. But I've missed a lot of school, but it's just, they've been so great to work with. And yeah, 